Welcome everybody, it's 7.35, so I think we'll officially start. Um, I just wanted to give the quick reminder again to our member families, to our current member families, that since our meetings had to shift to the Zoom platform due to COVID, we have the honor and privilege of bringing in experts and advocates to talk to us. Um, and for those of you who are um, new members um, to our school, during non-COVID times, the focus of our Wednesday meetings was on co-oping training. And obviously there was a community building component too. Um, but with our new um, shift, we have, um, the joy of welcoming alumni families and community members and to our alumni and community members we're so glad that you could join us um, we are also very glad that dr charles barrett um, is here charles is a nationally certified school psychologist author and speaker um, and i'm so excited that he came tonight to help us learn how to effectively engage in developmentally appropriate discussions with our children about race and racism. Um, so I am going to turn the floor over to you, Charles. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. And can you see my screen? Marvelous. Well, things are working. I appreciate the opportunity, the invitation, and I thank you um, for also having your cameras on. It's great to see people and we can engage. I know it's tough being on Zoom a lot, but I really appreciate your willingness to be on camera. I see some little friends, great to see children, um, certainly a big part of my life. A uh, couple things that I do, some teaching at Howard and George Mason, but I am a bona fide practitioner, school psychologist in year 13 up in Loudoun County and uh, just some national work with the National Association of School Psychologists and just a couple of things, author. Um, this is my website, so certainly check it out, www.charlesbarrett.org. You can learn more about me. I'll also say that I'll be sending these slides um, to Amy or someone, and uh, you can certainly have them as a reference. A couple of books I've written, you'll find these on the website. It's only the, the top right and the lower left corner books about my work um, as a school psychologist and just some things that I've learned along the way. So I'll share some of that with you, um, some of today in school psychology as we go along today. If you're a social media user, I do a lot of posting about kids and school psychology education. So feel free to follow along on Twitter and Instagram. Um, also on Facebook, just Charles Barrett. You'll see a picture of me and my wife. And uh, yeah, but certainly feel free to follow along. I primarily use these hashtags, hence the books that I just referenced. Um, if you if you if you see me now, I do a lot of posting about snow days as well. Love my work with kids, but I think I'm a big kid. I love the snow more than the kids love snow. So, looking forward to day two of a snow day tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, just a lot of fun out there in so on social media. Um, so, our time tonight, uh, about an hour together. Uh, four quick sections: um, connection then some content. I'm going to give you a short challenge and then we'll have a closing reflection or activity. So connection, content, a challenge, and then a closing um, tonight. I will spend our time together. I do want this to be as interactive as possible, so feel free to post questions, comments in the chat. Um, I typically don't reserve time at the end for that, so as we go along we can engage together. If you want to say something, certainly just note that in the chat then you can unmute and come on and we can dialogue and discuss together. So for connection, how are you feeling right now? A is the shopping cart, B, oh boy, heavenly joy is C, and D is on the couch cradled crying. E is all of the above and even combinations are okay. So in the chat, how are you feeling right now? <laughs> e, A, E, A and B, B and C, E, A and D, A, C, all the above. I see you, Emma. Thank you so much, E, but maybe D more than the others. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, it's a cute, it's a kind of a funny, you know, activity. I do it a lot with, you know, uh, 
educators, psychologists, and others, uh, we are great at telling other people what to do, but we also don't take our own advice. So I know as parents, as families, you want to, you know, take care of your children and your, your families, your, your homes, but I want to give you permission to feel whatever you need to feel. We are living in challenging times for a variety of reasons. The last nine months have been stressful for everyone in different ways. So I want to normalize however you're feeling. It is okay. Some of us have felt all these things in an hour, in a day. Maybe, maybe right now we're feeling all of them. So however you're feeling is totally all right. We're going to get through this session together. And I hope that you learn something new as we as we go along. So a couple of things from today in school psychology. You know, a large part of my job is uh, IQ testing. So I test children for disabilities, autism, you know, um, dyslexia and other things. So one of the questions I asked the student was, what is doubt? And she was totally confident it was negative energy. Wasn't the right answer, but really cool perspective from a nine-year-old about what doubt is. And this here, you know, back in September, things were kind of dropping outside, you know, temperatures. And I was with a second grader, came in all bundled up in a, in a jacket, maybe, maybe October. And I said, hey, you want to take a jacket? I'm going to be inside for a while. He said, no, it's cold freezing out there. Not cold, not freezing, but cold freezing. So just cute things, funny things that kids say. But I want to give you this as well, you know, as an educator, I like to tell teachers, admin, other psychologists, you know, counselors, speech pathologists, that they're our students, but they're, they're always someone's child. So at best, I see a kid from kindergarten through 12th grade, but they are yours forever. So I think how we frame things, how we discuss children, how we talk about them, needs to always be with sensitivity and grace because they are someone's child forever. And the last thing I'll share is that it's okay to disagree with a family uh, as long as you have listened to and valued their perspective. I often say that I may know kids in general, but you are an expert in your own child. So I think sometimes educators, teachers, psychologists, we can prematurely offer even the right answer or the right intervention, the right approach, but the family feels devalued. They, they, um, were not listened to and validated and what they were saying being valid for, for their child. So just a couple of things I share on social media and I typically end with this. Uh, oh, never mind. One more. I'm sorry. Testing a little, a little guy as well. Um, some, some time ago, he said to me, you are big and brown and have brown skin. First grader, just kind of in between test items. Then I often get this comment. Most of the kids in my school are not black students or they don't look like me. So never as children, typically K1 and 2, they see with a black student, they say, is he your father? I think it's a really cute statement, but what I realized is this, children admit to seeing color. Why don't we as adults? You know, so just some profound things that I've learned from students over time. Uh, this idea, this notion of being colorblind, I understand where it comes from, but it's really not helpful for students of varying backgrounds. So again, kids admit to, you know, I look differently than they do or someone else. Uh, as adults, we can also admit to that. The problem really isn't that we see color or see difference. It's what we attach or assign to difference that really is more problematic thing than acknowledging it um, by itself. So I typically end with, this is why a day without direct contact with a student is wasted. I've been missing students a lot since virtual learning started in March and we went to hybrid and then back to virtual now as of Tuesday. But uh, certainly check those out in Today in School Psychology. I think you'll like just the funny stories and wisdom from children. So today, fundamentally, I am not here to be critical, not here to criticize or critique anyone, but really want you to leave encouraged and inspired um, to really engage in these discussions and interactions with your children around race and racism in ways that are certainly appropriate developmentally. So I want to go on. So kind of this question to frame our time together, what do I need to know in order to effectively engage in discussions with my child or children about race, racism, and I added Black Lives Matter. I want to talk about that very quickly as we go along today. Uh, most of you, or I'm assuming all of you, have children who may be preschoolers 
Um, but you may also have some older children as well, some adolescents maybe. So I wanna give you some perspective on all of these for children of different ages, toddlers, preschool children, and then also adolescents as we go along. I wanna to try to get to something towards the end, some implications for educators or teachers, but we may not get to get there in our um, this evening. So we'll do the best we can. So essentially three questions, why is it important? How do I do it? And then at the end, what do I need to continue learning to engage in these activities well or effectively with my child or children? All right, let's go on. So here's our content. So you had some homework. Most of you, I think, received the short article, Peggy McIntosh. And I wanted to just kind of start some quick dialogue. You can unmute and come on if you if you note it in the chat first. But if you want to put in the chat your response to either one of these prompts. After reading the article, I learned, or after reading, this was confirmed, or after reading, I would like to know more about, or anything else, general general uh, reflection about the Peggy McIntosh piece that I think most of you received that um, sometime last week. So any response to any of those prompts or anything else that comes to mind from the piece? I reflected about the extent of my ease with navigating our systems. Thanks, Kuna. Anyone else? Can you explain, can you please post the link? I didn't see it. I'm gonna let Leslie or Amy take care of that. I can't do that right now, but maybe they can share it now or later. At, or at some point. I'd like to learn more about how to change for the better. Thanks, Leslie. As a white woman, her perspective spoke to me greatly. Thanks, Emma. Sarah, I learned there are so many more instances where my skin color helps that I didn't think about before. Thanks, Sarah. Beth, I'm sure um, Leslie or Amy is going to be is going to respond at some point. Um, doors open for me through no virtues of my own. Great, thanks, Amy. <clears throat> yeah, all these are are great responses. I sent it out just to kind of get us thinking about the reality of privilege. Uh, certainly, most of us on this call are white individuals, some of other race, ethnicity, but. Um, certainly, a lot of my work with the National Association of School Psychologists started uh, about four years ago, um, and we started with ideas or constructs like privilege, implicit bias, and intersectionality, and how those those ideas are really relevant to students and families that we serve. So this, I just kind of want to kind of get us thinking about the reality and of our positionality in society and what we bring to you know systems and, and how we interact with systems, how systems interact with us, and just uh, just to kind of build awareness of, of what that means for people of different backgrounds. I like how she frames it um, as a woman around gender or male privilege um, and using racial or white privilege as um, a really strong metaphor uh, for other types of privilege that also exist. It confirmed a lot of the areas of privilege and put into words some of my thoughts about my privilege. Also writing them down may help keep those in front of mind. Thanks, Charlotte. Great, thank you so much for all of your, your responses and input. I'm gonna come back to something from Macintosh towards the end of our session as well. Um, Janet, how privilege as a word is complicated, correct. There are positives that should be available to everyone and there are negatives that need to be addressed and dramatically changed. I also recognize my privilege in her description of whiteness, especially in the sense of false neutrality. Great. Myth of meritocracy, great. Thanks, Carolyn, Rebecca, Janet, wonderful. Thanks for your engagement and uh, participation. Really, really appreciate it. All 
All right, great. So I'm going to go on. If you want to still engage in the chat, I'll come back to it periodically. But certainly I'm going to offer that. But also look at this. I found this uh, some months ago. I'm not sure if anyone has seen this before, but power and privilege is not necessarily absolute. Like we have it or we don't, but there are degrees of it. So this just kind of looks at different identities or different aspects of all of us and how privileged we are depending on where we fall along the continuum I offer this caveat that anytime we try to um, kind of boil down complex ideas, phenomena like privilege into a single image, something is going to be lost. So this is not perfect by any means or different ways to represent it. But I do like how this um, really captures a lot of um, the reality of privilege in our society. Uh, and not just American society, you know, the idea of, of being darker complected is not unique to the USA, you know, even in other cultures, other countries, the darker you are, the more marginalized you may be um, in that society. So I just wanted to kind of offer that image as well as to something to, to consider as we think about race and racism um, as we go along this evening. So why is this important to even talk about with families, with parents um, of children who are certainly young children, you know, toddlers or preschool age. So I, I start with I start with this um, three things about race that I think are fundamental to our discussion tonight. The first thing is that race is a social construction. You know, for those of us who may be of different races or ethnicities, there is very little biological difference between us who may be black or white, Latinx, Asian, indigenous, uh, but it really is a, a model and it serves as the foundation for how other types of marginalization are um, remain active or are reinforced. Certainly not the only type, you know, the sexism, classism, I'm sure many of us um, read about the Wall Street Journal, Journal editorial about Dr. Jill Biden over the weekend. Uh, so certainly there's other types of discrimination, marginalization, oppression, but racism I do think gives us the language and a way to understand, to conceptualize other types of discrimination. Um, all of them need to be addressed in families and schools, but talking about race, especially how race um, oftentimes is confounded or co-varies with SCS and other types of uh, marginalization. It's important to really keep race in the forefront of our minds for, for those and other reasons. My work in Loudoun County Public Schools, you know, some things that we're talking about um, equity in, in hiring practices and instruction assessment. We talk about race and, and fundamentally we talk about race and racism and how that has led to inequities in, in our um, outcomes for, um, for our students. So as we speak tonight, there's a couple of guidelines I want to offer as well, even as you engage further, you know, in your own discussions. Everyone tonight is here to speak for themselves, your truth and no one else's. I know McIntosh talks about, you know, the idea that as a white person, you're often not called upon to represent your race or to speak on behalf of anyone but yourself. When you perform well or poorly, it's still the individual who is centered, not anything reflective of the larger group. Uh, but so, certainly all of these things, you know, assume that when people are sharing their truth, it's also authentic, you know, from their point of view or their perspective, this can be uncomfortable. Um, so experience, you know, discomfort, expect and ex um, expect and accept non-closure in some ways, but also want you to remain engaged and actively participate as much as you can this evening. This can also be uncomfortable for everyone uh, for different reasons, but for some white individuals, um, the reality of talking about race, because race may not be safe, Alient, you know, to you, uh, just the realities of privilege and how things are in this society. Sometimes we may want to um, divert to other topics, to gender, to SES, and other things. If you hear me say this, it's a quick prompt to come back to race. Want to isolate race? I think this came from um, Glenn Singleton's work and Curtis' conversation. So really isolating race and 
other things are relevant, sexual orientation, gender identity, all the things are real, but we're gonna try to isolate race today and really talk about race and racism as much as we can. All right, and then some sentence stars, okay, again, framing what I said before. It's not so much that we disagree, but it's how we disagree or when we disagree. So if you wanted to kind of use these as a guideline to frame some of your discussion points and chat, or even if you want to say it ver uh, verbally, uh, just some ideas I want to offer to you. All right, so why families? Why are families meaningful? Why are families significant to this discussion? Well, I would say it starts with relationship, the ones that you have with, with your children. This is Dr. James Comer, uh, child psychiatrist up at Yale, and he says, no real learning happens without significant relationship. So as I said before, you may not be an expert in child development, human development, psychology, education, but you are an expert in your own child. You know what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and how to best respond to them. And I think because of how sensitive this topic is, having it with someone that the child naturally has relationship with can be very helpful in their understanding. Um, especially for your older children, you know, those who may be maybe uh, nine, 10 into adolescence, some of these things they're already thinking about and may not have the language or um, just know how to express it. So when you engage or if you engage with your children around race and racism, you may not be shocking them with things that they haven't already considered uh, by themselves, but certainly it will give them um, more confidence and kind of uh, permission to engage in these dialogues and no one better than to do that than someone that they trust and that's you. Great book here, Beverly Tatum's book, um, just some things that she, um, she notes. I'll extend that, that middle image to families. We don't talk about race enough, not only in education, in schools, but also families and just finding ways to make it more accessible. Hopefully we can do that tonight. All right. First thing I'll say is that if we don't, we, I, I, I have a stepson who's 19, and if families don't proactively talk about race, like other topics, sex, drugs, alcohol, children come to their own conclusions about what these things are. And you don't want children to come to their own conclusions about any of those topics. So the way to really uh, kind of have some protective factor around it is that you steer the discussion, you steer the dialogue and frame it for them in healthy ways that give them good information um, and a place to ask questions and um, really grow in their understanding. Um, when we talk about being appropriate developmentally, this is beyond the child's age chronologically, but also their social and emotional maturity. So children can be four or five or six and have very different um, maturity socially, emotionally, cognitively. So again, knowing your child, knowing what you think they can handle, um, that really is in your court to determine um, what's appropriate for them to, to hear and to understand. I'll give you some general guidelines, you know, for, from research as we go along today. Um, but um, those, again, are just kind of anchors, you know, you know more than I do that, you know, with young children, these milestones of walking, talking, crawling are just kind of estimates. Some are earlier, some are later. Uh, so what I give you is going to be a general guide, but certainly knowing your child, what they're ready for, um, that's always going to be in your purview as the parent. This is a great image that shows how young uh, children are talking about race. So we just want to reinforce something that you may not be able to see there. Uh, teachers and families can play a powerful role in helping children of all ages develop positive attitudes about race and diversity and skills to promote a more just future, but only if we talk about it. I know when I talk to teachers and other educators, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of angst around talking about race because we don't really know what to say or how to approach it, but we really can't avoid it because silence also says something else. Silence says it's not okay to talk about this, so we don't want to do that even unintentionally. So let's get started. At birth, babies look equally at faces of all races, but by three months, they're looking more at those faces that match their own caregivers. So even as early as, as three months old, children are aware of race uh, and racial differences. At two, um, they use race to reason 
to understand what people do about people's behaviors. 30 months, two and a half years old, most children use race to choose their playmates. They're using race to choose who's my friend, who do I wanna play with, who do I wanna share with, even at two and a half years old. Five years old, black and Latinx children uh, show no preference toward their own groups compared to white children who are more likely to be strongly biased in favor of whiteness. Let me park there for one second. What are some reasons you think could, could account for that? Why might black and Latinx children not show preference, but white um, children at five years old may have a, a preference towards other white children? What's some, what's some thoughts around that idea? Images they see from society are great. Images so in, in media, TV, online, great. White children may be more accustomed to being in white dominant spaces. Excellent, thanks. Um, M-E-L-A-M-E-L -E -E and Anna, thank you so much, or Anna, I'm not trying to say your name, but great, great perspective. I think both of those could certainly be, be correct. Mimicking what their parents show, excellent, excellent, yeah. Thanks for prompting me, Lori. Um, you know, as, as a psychologist, when I work with, with children who are very young, a lot of my work may not be with the child themselves. It really is more parent training or parent skill building. Um, you know, to have a kid in counseling at four years old may not be that effective, but giving the parents strategies, ideas, ways to respond can be much more um, effective in building their capacity. So think of this as building your capacity rather than me working directly with your children. Um, pre racial prejudice can, can, can peak at four or five years old. And then here at five, right, kindergarten children show many of the same racial attitudes held by the adults in our culture. They've learned to associate some groups with higher status than others. Very, very powerful research. And then five to seven, expressive conversations about uh, with five to seven year olds about interracial friendship can dramatically improve attitudes in as little, little as a single week. So again, no child, as you know, no child is born racist, but we grow up in a race-based society. What are they seeing around them, media, TV, but certainly what are they seeing in their homes and from the people that they have uh, the most contact with? So you can find some more there, um, Children's Community School, really great website and resources that you can take advantage of. But, Let's talk about a couple of things here about toddlers. Um, so as I said before, you know, toddlers are noticing and already drawing conclusions about race. Um, but really most of that I think is coming from the models in their immediate environment, brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles. So one of the things that you can do for sure is normalize difference by having meaningful relationships with people of different groups. You know, um, I think one of the ways that, that parents or families determine their child's peer group is the parent or the family determines where they live. So you wanna expose your kids to certain school, certain opportunities, certain students or children around them. You dictate that by where you live in your neighborhood. Um, same thing goes for how you want your children to understand race and racial relations uh, is if all of your friends are from the same background, that communicates something very strong to your child. It may not be intentional, but even unintentionally, the child views that world as normal. And that can be problematic um, for children. Think about when toddlers fall and you know they fall on the floor, they hit their head or something. What do they do intuitively or instinctively? They fall down and what do they do almost immediately? Look to you exactly, Kuna. They look to you for your response and how you respond determines if they cry or keep going. If you look worried, they cry. Something's wrong, mom is worried, dad's worried, I must be hurt and they start crying. If you say, no, it's okay, they brush it off and keep going. So that, that third point there, uh, toddlers look for their parents to approve when another child wants to play with them on the playground. How do you respond 
and when a child of a different race comes to approach your child. Even instinctively, you may not even be aware of it, but unconsciously, does your facial expression change? Do you seem more nervous? Do you seem more apprehensive when that happens? So some things to think about. Um, they can certainly understand diversity and race in positive terms, but this last one is really, really important. And it gets to that whole thing about what's appropriate for them developmentally. They should not be exposed to kind of the, the gory, gruesome details of the realities of race and racism um, through TV news or social media. So things like George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and um, Breonna Taylor, those things I would say are not appropriate for toddlers. And even when you're discussing these events with other friends or family members, they should not be in earshot of that. They may not understand the words, but they, they get your tone, they get the emotion, and they are very sensitive to that. So to protect them at this age, I would caution you against engaging in certain discussions um, you know, when they are so young. I'm gonna get to that in one second. If, if, that, if that's still Kuna, I'm gonna get to that very, 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 very shortly. Thank you for that question. So let me show you this quick video. Um, then we'll go on. It's very, very short. I don't know if you know who this person is, but you may when you see it. Kate Conkite. Do you see that? Great. Kate Conkite says, we often hear it's important to get to know Black people to start a dialogue, but how do you do that if you live in an all-white world, Kate Cronkite wants to know. Kate, let me say this to piggyback on, on, on the wise words Oprah just said. Just because the world is white doesn't mean your world has to be. Right. Um, the church. <laughs> Just because the world is white, Kate, it does not mean your world has to be. Um, again, I you went to You are only 30. A... Look at all, oh, they look at these pearls. Just dropping like that. And you're only 30. <laughs> Kate, that is it right there. Everybody give a hand clap shout out to that. Hello, high five. Just look because... at the... <laughs> Say it again. Say it again. Kate, okay. just because the world is white. It does not mean your world has to be. When I grew up, again, all white private school. I, I graduated with like five people of color. Um, oh, oh, that man. world was white, but my world wasn't. See, I still had some black friends, like I told you at church, like I told you in, in small groups, like I told you in sports. Hey, black people exist. It's not like black people are hiding under rocks. You just cannot be like water. Kate, if I were to pour water on the ground right now, it would take the easiest path, the path of least resistance. We navigate the easiest path. But I live in this white neighborhood. Let me just go to the white youth leagues and the white church and the white temple and the white this and the white that. Kate, push against the path of least resistance. Um, it'll be better for everyone. I wanted to share that I, I, I'm, I'm in the process of reading his book, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but I, I do think what we're talking about here takes some intentionality on all of our parts to really have um, spaces, professional spaces, personal space that really re reflect the reality of, of, of human diversity. Acho or Acho. Um, this is his book, Uncomfortable to This Conversation with a Black Man. Uh, really, really great book that I'm working my way through, but I want to show that that quick uh, example because it did underscore one of the previous, previous points. Thanks for that comment um, in there, but going to this slide here. So again, what cues are you even unintentionally giving your child based on the um, lack of diversity that may be in your personal or professional setting? that they are still picking up on um, as their normal. All right, so moving on here, preschoolers believe that everyone should be treated fairly. If you have preschool children, often they say that's not fair. 
they have more than I do, or they went first again, all these things that preschoolers say that's totally normal and appropriate for their age. Um, but using concrete and relatable examples about fairness and feelings can be the most appropriate way to engage with uh, preschools about race and racism. You know, things like some people may not have gifts for the holidays because their families don't have money to buy them. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. And what can we do to help them might be, you know, one example to illustrate a pretty, you know, heavy topic um, in a way that kind of gets down to their fairness and feelings level. Like toddlers, you know, certainly exposing them to these heavy weighted conversations that you may have, you know, with adults are still not, not appropriate, you know, for where they are emotionally and socially. If they do ask you what's happening, you know, mommy, why are you sad? Daddy, why are you upset? Why are you sad? Um, I would always validate their feelings and that you are there to protect them and keep them safe. Um, they may not, again, need to know all the details if we get to who needs to know that as we get, get to the next slide. Um, but, but, but preschoolers like toddlers, I think, need to be affirmed that however they're feeling is okay and that you're there to keep them safe with certainly feelings of fairness um, and um, feelings and fairness would be the ways that I would kind of characterize what's going on around them. This is some things from PIJ that I won't get into right now. Um, developmental psychologists that we learn a lot from, but uh, where we do get to talking about some things is childhood. And childhood, I would say, is eight or nine years old um, going into adolescence. Um, at this point, they may be well aware of what's on TV, what's on the news, what's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I would monitor how much they're consuming those things or how much you're consuming those things when they're around. And you may see you know, those things in, in yellow, any change in eating patterns, sleeping patterns, do they seem anxious? Are they hyper-focused on asking you about, about the news? And I would say that this applies to any traumatic event, you know, earthquakes and other nat natural disasters that are going on, even COVID, if, if they're preoccupied with asking you questions about the vaccine and why people are getting sick, that could be a sign that maybe they're consuming too much of what's around them. The best way to engage children at this age would be to engage in discussions with them rather than sending them off to watch TV or things um, by themselves. You can monitor how they're processing as you read together, as you watch things together. Um, I would be mindful, I'm gonna get this more on the next slide. Uh, one of the key things at this age is being mindful of language and the words you use to describe what they may be seeing on TV or social media. So what I mean by that is this. So when they talk, when you talk about protests, when they ask about protests, I would stay away from words like riots. Um, but I would say demonstrations, protests, marches, and rallies. It's a very different connotation uh, using those terms versus the term of a riot. The first point that, that I overlooked is that always focus on the reason that people are doing these things rather than what they see as the outcome or the consequence of what they see on TV. Um, this other clip I'm going to show you very quickly uh, talks about how families can do this together. And it's a great little um, video that I want to show you. Give me one second. and a shopper will safely deliver them contact-free in as fast as two hours. So while you... I'm sorry, one second. I shouldn't have done that. Everyone close your eyes for 10 seconds. 
I am so I shouldn't have, I tried to skip the ad and it messed up. Give me one minute. Let's get this party started. Sorry, 25 seconds. This might get a little rough. We're going Christmas balls to the wall. Let's deck these halls. <laughs> The ripple effects for the protests for racial equality and social justice have been built around the world. It's left a lot of families looking for ways to teach their kids about these issues. New York Times Parenting recently ran a piece about families who are protesting together and how the lessons are passed through generations. Let's take a look. Across the country and all over the world, within the seas of peaceful protesters, are young faces. Children are protesting alongside their parents. In the Hargrove household, it was 13-year-old Caden who first decided to get involved. I thought it would be a good idea to go as a family. What I saw all around was that they felt embraced. They were excited about people honking their horns and supporting us. Um, and in the end, when I asked the five-year-old and the eight-year-old, how do you feel? What did that make you feel like? And they all said, I felt really good. I'm hoping that my children can see that they have power in their voice. Um, if they get together with people, that those changes can happen. We have uh, a struggle uh, as a family, so we have to march as a family. For Councilman Robert White Jr. and his wife Christy, peacefully protesting is a family calling. From the youngest to the oldest, it's important that everyone feels that they have an obligation to do this and that they pitch in however big or small their contribution is, that they, they get up and they do it. In black families, you unfortunately always know when you have kids that there are certain life experiences that they are gonna have and that you have to prepare them for. Uh, I didn't uh, think about the fact that I would have a three-year-old and a one-year-old uh, marching with me in, in what are really uh, civil rights marches. I hoped when I was younger that I wouldn't have to pass on these traditions, uh, but now I hope that my children won't have to pass on these traditions to their children because of the work we're doing now as a family. I think for our family, it was as simple as being invited by our friends. And our sort of family motto is that we show up. Um, and that's for a lot of things, you know, but, but specifically in terms of what's going on right now in our country. The Metcalf family is using this moment in history as a teachable one for their two sons. So the core philosophy in our house is that you might not control outside events, but you do control how you respond to those events. Our family will continue to protest in March until, um, until we're all equal. Jay Gioni Palmer and his eight-year-old son Middleton started marching together in early June after Middleton had questions about the death of George Floyd. I told him that as long as there's breath in, in my lungs, I would make sure that that never happened to him. Um, but more importantly, that we will not live in fear. So the two of us marched out, you know, down the street. And first day was just the two of us. And then, um, you know, our numbers grew. Most of the days, of them, um, about half of the people who were out there were under the age of 12. Initially, the kids, some of the kids were scared. <clears throat> but I think as they, you know, more kids started coming and they started hearing the honks in support, that helped out a lot. So by the end, they, they were loving it. The road to racial equality is a long one, but these families are committed to that journey one step at a time. It's a relay race, right? We got to pass it on. The baton was handed to me, and I got to hand the baton off at some point. I need to teach him and his little brother and their friends how to catch the baton and don't drop it and pass it on, you know, when it's their time. So how can parents help their children's voice? Give me some reflections on that quick video in the chat. Anything come to mind?
quick, um, I guess, fun fact. Robert Wright is a, a councilman in DC. I grew up with his wife, Christy, in Long Island, Freeport, New York. We grew up together from elementary school through high school. Really great, great folks. Any reflections on, on that video? I think the idea is that children at this, even younger, if you do want to engage them, the important thing is being with them to kind of monitor what's going on around them. Um, that, again, that, that feeling of safety and security that, you know, adults are here to protect you and keep you keep you safe and, and, and free from harm. You know, that last two, those last two points, um, you know, in school, we talk about active engagement. So as students are, um, you know, participating, answering questions as they're writing, responding to things, offering ideas, they learn more than passively just attending and kind of absorbing information. So how we get them engaged actively is certainly going to be something that's going to be more beneficial to them to learn, but also to um, feel, feel like they're contributing to a cause that's larger than them. Um, they always end things positively by reassuring them again about safety and then they can, they can make a difference. Um, I'm gonna, now going to go through this. This is a, just a quick thing um, from Eric Holder as far as the stories that uh, you can also use as examples of injustice um, and how the reality of race can affect people at different ages. So this is one way that parents can use a, a quick story that that may not be your background, but people of different backgrounds may not have the same experience that you do. And certainly Eric Holder has speak, spoken about that in the past. I offer, offer these images of, you know, Tamir Rice on the right, 12 year old who was shot and killed um, by police in Ohio a couple of years ago, I think it was about five years ago now or more. And then Atiana Jefferson, I always think about her nephew. They were playing video games and again, um, shot in her home and how he's feeling. So just, again, just thinking about these things that affect children um, around us. Adolescents, very quickly, for those of you who may have older kids, for obvious reasons, they are the most prepared of children to engage in the most detailed dialogue. I would use current events and what's happening around them as teaching moments, even COVID. I would ask them, how do you think race and racism um, is even important for what we see going on around COVID-19. Um, they may be at a point, you know, 12, 13, maybe not 12, but 15, 16 years old to attend things unsupervised. So they go with their friends and may go with, you know, schools or whatever. Uh, but I think at this point, they want to feel like they're a part of a cause that's larger than they are, even more than children. I think that when they write letters, when they, you know, make signs, um, they're coming into their own identity about what do I believe as an individual, kind of where, what are my core values and beliefs? And I think at this age, powerful moment for them to be supported and in, um, in their own advocacy um, to really talk about injustice around them. You can read that for yourself as we go along. But let me address this very quickly because I, I want to share with you what I believe is Black Lives Matter rather than some of what I think has been misinterpreted as Black Lives Matter. Um, when I'm talking about Black Lives Matter, it is always the principle that Black life is worthy of being valued. Um, and I know that this could be a loaded statement, whether or not it should or should not be is up for is up for debate. I don't think it should be, but you know, of course, others have have different views. I did hyperlink, you know, in the slides, the Black Lives Matter website, so you can read for yourself what, you know, what they're about. But really, this organization or this movement, I should say, is in response to Trayvon Martin's murder back in 2013. But it really is a response to the devaluing of Black lives. And it's never meant to uh, devalue anyone else, which really Black Lives Matter too, or Black Lives Matter also, Black Lives Matter as well. So certainly I think people think about the political platform, and you can agree or disagree with, with that. I have differences in the platform as well, but the value, the principle that Black Lives is worth, Black Lives are worthy of value and protection and safety, that to me is non-controversial. Um, so whenever I offer it, 
I offer with, with that framing, um, never to promote anyone's agenda, but really how it started was really how do we protect um, the value of, of Black life. Um, so again, going back to the importance of language and the words that we use, um, you know, of course, King did use the word riot back, I think it's 68, um, I think it was, but I posted this some time ago, the oppressor or the system does not have the right to tell the oppressed how to protest. Protest does not require permission. So I think all the demonstrations, the rallies, the protests are really in response to not being heard. You know, um, Acho or um, Acho referenced it, you know, when, when Colin Kaepernick knelt, that was misconstrued something else. So all these things have been going on for a while. Uh, so just again, just giving you language to frame what's going on. I was driving four years ago on 95, coming back home from seeing my parents in Charlotte. And this thought came to me. And I wonder if my friends Leslie and Amy can help me read a couple of things. Would you mind? Wonderful. Leslie, you're first. Everyone has a birthday and because each person's birthday is special, it should be celebrated. But, be, but consider this, how would you feel if it was your birthday, but a party was thrown for everyone at your school, place of employment, or even in your family? How would you feel if everyone received presents on your birthday? Thank you, Amy. This, my friends, is the difficulty with pitting all lives matter against Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was never intended to reduce the significance of all lives. As everyone's birthday is special, significant, meaningful, and deserves to be celebrated exclusively, it is also fitting to only acknowledge the person whose birthday it actually is. Great. Is my friend Kuna on? I know I saw you earlier. I'm here in the dark. In the dark, okay, can you read for me? Can you see? Sure. All right, thank you. For example, today is John's birthday and we will celebrate them with a song and gifts. Or today is Jane's birthday and we will celebrate them with dinner and gifts. Rather than saying happy birthday to everyone when in fact it's only John or Jane's birthday today, we will only honor John or Jane because the, ma the matter uh, they matter most for this moment. When it's your birthday, we'll be sure to only highlight and honor you. Yes, thank you so much. So that's my quick analogy of Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. The focus is on the person who's really should be focused upon, like it's someone's birthday. And when it's your birthday, you'll get all the attention. The attention belongs right now on those who are at risk for being mistreated for a variety of reasons, race being, being the primary one. So hope that helps, again, in your frame when you talk to your children, even others, you know, friends, colleagues um, about this, um, about what Black Lives Matter is. All right, almost done. What do you think about this? I know we've probably seen this. I'm looking for two E words, throw it in the chat. The E word on the left and the E word on the right. I can find my chat. Equal, equity and equality, yes, great, 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 great. So on the left is equality, giving every kid the same, and then equity, giving each person or child what they need to have access. Defense representing systemic barriers, could be racism, could be poverty, could be a whole host of factors. So beware of this statement. I know in school we say, I treat all my kids the same, and that's not necessarily a positive statement. Um, like as parents, you may say that I love all my children equally, but I don't treat them the same because they have unique needs, personalities, and therefore need to be responded to differently. So just kind of be aware of that, that sameness um, idea. Um, you know, these other images of poking holes in the system would be justice, and then removing those barriers would be liberation. But this is my favorite one here. When we give people what each one needs according to their size or ability. I like this because it shows the idea of making progress or moving forward. They can ride the bicycle and get somewhere when they're given what's really um, beneficial for their 
unique circumstance. This is way back in 1978, Henry Black, U, uh, US Supreme Court Justice. In order to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way. And in order to treat some persons equally, we must treat them differently. So again, this idea of we're all the same is really not accurate. So to get to equal or to um, equal outcomes or opportunity, we do have to treat some people differently, hence more boxes or supports for um, different groups. All right, just a couple of things I've shared again on social media. I just want to give you this, you know, these words are far from synonymous and I want to focus on inclusion, which is meaningful participation. So people of different backgrounds, I've even trying, I've tried to get away from using diversity in my, um, in my language and my vocabulary because diversity really centers whiteness. So different from white would be diversity, white being the norm. So I've used other terms to kind of reflect um, students of various backgrounds, but inclusion is really meaningful participation. Although you have different people, races, ethnicities, um, SES, does everyone feel valued in that group? Does everyone feel like they can make a meaningful contribution to whatever you're trying to accomplish or achieve? So in your school community, in your own communities, um, are people of various backgrounds um, included to the fullest extent possible? Do they feel a part of the group? And that I, I really think is at the core of when we talk about Black Lives Matter, are Black individuals or other racially, ethnically minoritized individuals included in the larger society in ways that their white counterparts are? So here's my challenge for you. You know, there's a lot of posting going on back in the summer about anti-racism. I think that's good. I, I think that there's a place for that. I think that's healthy. Um, what I wonder is that, does that become performative? You know, look at me, I'm an anti-racist. Um, or does the advocate overshadow the cause for which they are advocating or the community that they're advocating on behalf of? But you know, all the posting was great, you know, sharing articles and books and things, but really that was the easy part. That was just getting started. Um, the real work is every day doing something about it, how we live, how we engage, how we interact with our children and those in our, our various circles. But I wanna show you this quick quote from, from McIntosh. She says, I have met very few men who are truly distressed about systemic unearned male advantage and conferred dominance. And so one question for me and others like me is whether we will be like them or whether we will get truly distressed, even outraged about unearned race advantage and confirmed dominance. And if so, what will we do to lessen them? So again, what are we going to do about it? And I think how we engage with our children around these, these discussions, these conversations, these dialogues can be very much a part of that, what we do about it. Um, closing, we'll give you a couple of resources, just a quick, review that um, of what we covered um, today. But that last point about re remain a learner, here are some points that are um, some hyperlink resources. The last one uh, will take you to a public facing um, website from the National Association of School Psychologists where a lot of my work is done. And these are some great resources for everyone, if you're a psychologist or not, educated or not, just for people to grow in their understanding of these concepts. Uh, again, we started more formally about four years ago around implicit bias, uh, privilege, and intersectionality. But all of these are great, great resources for your continued professional growth and learning around these ideas. What time is it? Oh, ooh, gosh, I'm out of time. I'm so sorry. So I'm not going to get to what I wanted to. Real, real quick, just two books that I'm, again, going through. Um, I'm not here to endorse either one. I'm here to say that positionality matters. 
In other words, being a black male writing about racism um, as Kendi is, is very different than being a white woman, um, D'Angelo. I think both books have value and are certainly maybe targeting different aspects of this discussion, different audiences perhaps. Uh, but again, I just want you to be aware of the positionality of where people are coming from and how that's hard to separate that from the content that they're producing. Last comment about right fragility. Um, that, that can be a loaded term. Um, and I say that because sometimes I think it's overused. Um, I think sometimes white individuals are legitimately struggling with the idea, having never heard it before, having never had to contend or think about um, race and their own you know, whiteness. Um, so I don't think the questions or uh, what seems to be defensive is always fragility, uh, but I think it's, it could be just legitimate. I don't understand this. I've never had to think about it, you know, ever. And I'm, you know, a middle-aged white person being, um, you know, asked to really, you know, challenge my thinking. So again, just want to, want to offer that as as perspective because certainly it it is a real concept. But I don't think it's always applied accurately to everyone who may be struggling legitimately with, you know, what they're learning. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and we can dialogue if you, I know I talk much too long, but my apologies. Any questions or comments? I, I did have a few more slides. Um, this is my last slide, my email and website. You can certainly um, email if you have any questions, but I had a few more things um, to talk about, but those are more for teachers and other school-based staff. So we can dialogue if you would like to. Thank you. Where as a school we could go with some of these concepts. Yeah, so as a school, the easy thing to say is keep talking about it. Um, but there's an activity that if I had time, I would go through with you around implicit bias in preschoolers. Uh, but I don't want to take your time tonight. It's a really cool study. Uh, best books for the preschool set. Um, books, I don't know, but look up this guy. I may be getting with some of my thunder because um, he's the, the one I wanted to talk about with, with his study. But Walter Gilliam is a school psychologist up at the Yale Child Study Center. Um, and he has a fascinating, fascinating study about implicit bias in um, teaching, teaching staff or adults, uh, educators uh, with preschoolers. So check out his work. It's on YouTube. There's a couple of videos about it. Uh, but I was going to share that with you, but I don't want to abuse the time tonight. But it's great, great, fascinating work. Um, I would look at that. Um, I, I would do some continued reflecting around privilege. Um, not that everyone is struggling with it, but sometimes I, I'm cautious to see to say how fast we can move forward without really wrestling with some constructs by ourselves or internally first. So those resources that I gave you on that um, on that last slide I showed you, or second to last slide, I would definitely, let me show you the website really quickly. Um, that might help. This is the website that I was um, referring to from the National Association of School Psychologists. And all of these on the left are the resources, there's some lesson plans. These are more for older students, like in secondary school. Um, but there's a great podcast series and um, some of these resources. There are some parent resources as well. Um, most of our work does tend to be school age, so elementary school and up. Uh, but some of these could be helpful for families uh, there are a couple books on here as well, um, so you can kind of peruse this site. If you email me, I may be able to give you some more detailed feedback uh, with some other ideas. I just came off of a, a um, four-session kind of PD work with the school in California, but they were 
uh, again, school age, like elementary to middle school students. Um, but I would certainly look at Walter Gilliam's work. Um, Kendi has a children's book. I uh, haven't read that one. It's a short kind of an alf alphabet book format. Um, and that may also be a good resource to, to consider. But I, again, I'll, I'll go back to what I was sharing earlier that um, a lot of what I think needs to happen would be uh, building capacity of adults. So how, how much can you do of your own learning and that will, would come out in how you engage with, with students and your children. So any of these resources on this website or the other ones on that slide, which I'll send to Amy, she can send to you, I think would be good places to, to continue. But if you have more detailed questions, certainly email me and we can chat more. Thanks, Alyssa. That's a great idea. No problem, Lori, thank you. Other questions or comments? Absolutely, Leslie. I think a lot, a lot of this starts and stops with relationship and perspective that you have as a parent, as a family that you can really use to leverage um, you know, great discussions with your children. Really on Macintosh about teaching our children to listen to as individuals and individual beings. Yeah, no, so that's that's a great um, question, um, Brian. I think it's 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 a lot. You know, what I got from Macintosh wasn't only that, but also this idea of intersectionality. And there's a resource on here somewhere about that on this um, school psychology website, um, meaning that we're more than race, but we're race, we're gender, we're class or FES or faith group or all these, you know, language. Um, so your question is, we are individual beings embedded in ecology systems relationships. How does this idea play in your research? C can you come on, Brian, and maybe explain it a little more to me? I want to make sure that I'm understanding your question. Uh, hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, I was just kind of reflecting to myself. I'm also an educator. Okay. Um, and so I teach um, high school. So I spend a lot of time talking about the way that a self can be built and constructed from different aspects of one's identity and experiences and so forth. And so, you know, in, in my own reading, you know, approaching a, a, a critique of the idea of the individual as being, as being problematic is what leads us into the kind of blindness and obliviousness that Macintosh talks about. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we can teach our children to be aware of the extent that their, their sense of themselves are built by so many different uh, components mm -hmm. uh, down to their very, very like cellular makeup, you know, um, that's just something that I'm, I'm generally curious about. Yeah, so I, I guess my, my first response comes from, I guess, Macintosh is saying that from the perspective of this Western American kind of framework that we are, you know, individuals and the collective is not as as valued. So one of the things that I've been talking to teachers about is really how we embed other cultures or other perspectives in the curriculum. And when it gets to be less Eurocentric, I, I think that's one way to um, challenge or push back on this idea of I'm my own person. So bringing in, you know, other cultures, other perspectives, um, even in my own syllabi, I've been very intentional about, um, you know, we call it decolonizing the curriculum, uh, but even giving them readings from different people, as I was sharing about, you know, Kendi and D'Angelo, um, just by their own personal makeup, they approach these things very, very differently, a Cho as well. Um, so I think, the more we can give students um, different perspective, different viewpoints, vantage points, and allow them to make their own informed decision, that's what I believe is the role of a, a good teacher or even parents in guiding their development. Um, that's what that really answers your question, but I think it's it, it's certainly a um, it's valuable because I do think it's it does lay at the root of a lot of what we see going on. Um, I think part of that is we are such a siloed society and we think about this one perspective 
And as we broaden that, I do think we can start to deconstruct that idea and become a lot more collective in our approach. Thanks for the question. No worries. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, here's my email, I'll throw it in the chat um, for you. Charles at charlesbarrett.org. You can reach me there if you have other questions and want to dialogue further. But again, all these things here um, are going to be great. I, I did give you some ideas on that slide about kind of where to start, but just peruse the website. You know, you can certainly find some things that are going to be, be worthwhile. And I can also get some ideas if you, if you email me with some more specifics. I can maybe point you in different directions. Other comments or questions? Be honest, was this helpful? Put a one in the chat if it was, two if it was not, and you won't hurt my feelings. Thank you so much. Hope you're being honest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate and Andrew, everyone. Thank you so much. Emma, Sunny, Charlotte, everyone. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Beth. No problem. All right, Leslie, Amy. Is it Sri? Is that, am I saying that correctly? Thank you. All right. Thanks, Teresa.